Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you so much for taking out time for this session. Uh, in this session, we'll be talking about a few of the uh, global topics which are gaining mainstream uh, traction within the population, within the youth. So we have picked three topics, and we have a few questions. Uh, which are preliminary questions regarding those topics, and we'll try to dive deeper into those topics as well. Uh, first one being, it's a very hot topic these days uh, regarding the evolution and the theory of evolution. It's being called a fact of evolution, and uh, uh, we have compiled a few of uh, uh, short clips, uh, lectures from the most famous uh, uh, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. We'll play it for you, and then we'll ha we have some follow-up questions from you regarding the paradigm which is being created, which is being mainstreamed through those lectures and through those arguments. Uh, so we'll deep dive into those questions. So first, uh, let's go through the video, and then we'll have follow-up. I think I generalize that to anything that's not evidence-based where factual knowledge is concerned. Um, so I would also like to rid the world of superstition of all kinds. So I think perhaps the single most convincing fact, the observation that you could point to would be the, um, the pattern of resemblances that you see when you compare the genes using modern DNA techniques, actually looking at the letter-to-letter -letter correspondences between genes. Compare the genes of any pair of animals you like, uh, pair of animals, pair of plants, and then plot out the resemblances and they fall on a perfect hierarchy, a perfect family tree. And the only so if you go back and back and back and back and back far enough, you'll come to a fish. And yet, every single generation is the same species as the previous generation. But actually, it's a gradual change all the way through, from embryo to baby to infant to toddler to etc. And um, so there's no one moment when you change from one, one of these states to another. And exactly the same in our ancestry. There's no one moment when any species changes into another species. It happens all gradually. So, if, but if you take that gradual process back and back and back far enough, you'll come to a fish. And, uh, all sorts of things which are based on e emotion and tradition, uh, revelation, um, authority, rather than on evidence. If all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. A mind like that, it seems to me, is, well, a disgrace to the human species. So that was Richard Dawkins talking about evolution and how evolution is basically uh, the mainstream paradigm. And it is based on the evidentialism, the idea of evidentialism, that whatever we see, we are going to believe it. And they use a lot of jargons, and all these jargons are actually, you know, they are very daunting. And whenever a common person listens to these jargons, they are very, you know, they, they think that whatever they are saying makes a lot of sense. So my first question is, uh, when it comes to the evolutionary biology, the talk of the genes and genetics and how these arrangements of alphabets can be traced back to human beings being originated from a fish, what do you think is a problem with this approach? And the tangibility of the conclusion, because we are, we are, you know, they they thump their chest on the fact that now it's a fact, evolution is a fact. So, what do you think is a problem with the process and with the tangibility of the conclusion? Okay, two problems. Uh, he, he proposed in three arguments, not just one. But okay, the whole, you know, steadiness of the temperament of a species before it transits into the next. That's his primary argument. But okay, uh, let's just try and get you a single answer so that everybody understands the real problem. We all came from a fish, according to the evolutionary. Well, it's not a fact, it's an opinion, but, but their data is telling them, not anybody else. Because it's a very big stretch of their own imagination. Uh, and I don't want them to stop imagining because uh, I'll tell you where to look for the real answer. If it were so that this is a steady process that every human being came from a fish and there is a definitive species of human beings now, which is uh, the chordates and then, you know, the homo sapiens, then we would not have that sort of a sudden 
sudden and imminent and very clear factual uh, change in the way human beings come to this planet. We actually literally come from a fish-like substance to a human being in a matter of seconds. You know what I'm saying? So it's not a steady process. It's, you know, whenever I used to read about abiogenesis in Aristotle, I used to just wonder as to why is he skewed towards abiogenesis a little more than necessary or required. Just like this, whenever I see evolutionary scientists, I just don't know why they don't understand the human birth because it is as sudden as it gets. One second a human being is breathing through and living through a totally different realm, which does not qualify for any other stage, for any other chordates. But in the next second, he's going to be breathing air, he's going to be behaving in a totally different biological manner. This is not evolution, this is right in front of us. So it's not steady. Now, coming back to his original and uh, central argument that, you know, since there's so similar, so much similarity for in, within the gene code of every species, and then there's a problem here. If there is such a big and stark similarity between every species predating it to a fish, then the fish would predate it to, you know, the, the protozoas. And, okay, let's just keep it to the fish for now. Then the, the transitionary species statistically would be in millions more in number than the definitively uh, the, the, the two species which are, you know, on either ends of this. Uh, yeah, that survives actually. Yeah, well, they would have to. There would be not only a million types of transitionary species, but every one of that transition should have way more number of its uh, you know, species, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, traces now, now in fossils or whatever form, then what we found, find for definitively different species, particularly, uh, you know, species worth mentioning right now. So since we don't find the middle neck horse, we only find the giraffe and the horse, the middle size neck of a horse would and has to be more than a million times more than either the giraffe or the horse. But we never find the middle size neck horse. We only find the giraffe and the horse. And this is such an abundance of data because of the, the, the chain of species that they're trying to, you know, line up to the fish that we would be filled up with fossils and every very would actually see would be finding evidence. We, we don't actually find evidence for these transitions. So you're saying that they try to contest this whole argument on the back of evidence and there is lack of evidence even in the fossil records. When it yeah, comes to, you know, so yeah, that's what I, I, I am saying. You are a disgrace to the fish if you are not human beings because you called yourself from a fish, right? Because if there is no evidence between a fish and any other species, uh, not that we know of, uh, but I, since you only, only played this video and he only talked about this, but my own primal argument is not against evolution based on whatever this mumbo jumbo is, because this is not enough, uh, uh, because this is self-explanatory that they do not have enough evidence of... That's a work in progress, actually. Well, no, no, not even that. They're not even looking for the transitionary. Uh, transitory species. They're just saying it's just there. I mean, if they were working for it or working towards it or looking for it, I would have been like, okay, yeah, okay, you know what? Let's see whether we find something. Or, you know, when they find something, they find it in, at, a, at, a, at a, you know, unicellular or, or, or let's just say a uh, very primitive level of uh, animalia, which is, you know, protozoa or, or, or amoeba or whatever. That's where they're actually finding traces of, you know, transition of species. I want to see a middle size neck horse or anything of that kind or a fish with feathers which could fly at some time because they have to be billions of fish in number because it requires more time for that species to inhibit for the, the, the succession to happen in a totally different level from the fish to the bird. This species has to be a, in a very long for a long, long, long time 
for it to give birth to a totally different species which does not look like the grandmother of the bird, which is the fish in this case. So that, that obviously leads to a second question because on the back of evolution and you know the strength of the argument and whatever they are trying to propagate, uh, they also challenge the argument of the creationists because they say that the big problem that Darwin solved was that he explained this complex world around us through a simple you know, process of evolution. So they say that we don't need the concept of a, a creationist to actually explain whatever is happening around us. This was just a process which was kicked off by an, a simple by, amoeba and then… That, well, the, yeah, that's what the question is. I'm not talking about God here. Where did that first amoeba come from? Is the, for, forget amoeba. Amoeba is too much of a… because that, that came here. I'm talking about the first atom ever. Where did that come from? Because you know what I'm saying? This is where it comes down to. So whenever you find out… Uh, a mind like this or a person like this, we, we are wasting his time as well, not just ours, by, by talking about intermediacies. We should talk about the origin of species, any species, origin of the universe, origin of life. Those are the deeper questions and the real questions. So let me just give you a, 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 an example here, and especially for Darwin. When you actually start from a single cell to the current day human being, you forget the most important part of being a human being. And that's the other part of the human being. No human being can come in this planet unless there are two distinctly different human beings coming together. You know what I'm saying? And that distinctively different human being is called a woman. So the evolution of the man has to be, has to be, and I repeat has to be, in the billions of years, what are the chances of another dimension of evolution going on from the same cell, by the way, that what are the chances of the same man with in timeline that another cell was producing another woman, which of course it didn't because the woman has to come from a man or a man-like substance back in the chain. So that man-like substance has to make that conscious decision to make a totally different anatomy of the same man with a, you know, a uterus and ovaries and, and whatnot that goes on with the, uh, with the symmetry intact. So this perfect symmetry with totally different anatomy, totally different function has to come from a single man-like substance. Otherwise, a man made the woman. And that's what we're saying that the man made the woman. Or the woman with the man for all I care, I don't care. But the question is, either one cannot make, uh, 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 both of them cannot come at the same time. St statistically, if you run the numbers on a woman coming from the same cell, statistically, you, I don't even want to do the math because a man coming in the billionth of year, billions of years of, you know, what the timeline of all of this is. And all of a sudden, a woman just happens to be there. It just happens to be there. I mean, we were just having a hard time running our calculators on how a man could be here. And all of a sudden, there's another totally different woman here. And at the same time, now they're going to mate and make more babies. Really? She just happened to walk around? And, and the, the whole process of actually reproduction, which was, you know, self-replicating. That yeah. also That's why I'm calling it a man-like substance. That man-like substance has to have some sort of a very conscious design so that he can design the uterus and the ovaries from within and keep the symmetry from the outside. Not just that, he has to design the reciprocative chemistry inside the man to get attracted to this sort of anatomy. He has to do the math simultaneously for both of these things because they cannot survive. They will never ever mate if the man is not attracted to the woman. If the man is attracted to the woman, that means it is in design of the man to get attracted to the woman. So whoever is designing the man-like substance is designing the woman-like substance is going to create the woman, right? So he has to do alternative or parallel math all the time. So the source is the same and that's... Not just the same, the consciousness of the source is the same. And the design and the planning is the same. So I get that, they, they, they plan from amoeba, so I get it. It's an amazing planning sense of the amoeba. It designed the whole, or plan, or let's just say haphazardly try and mutate, according, adapt it, and so on. But this is not a matter of adop adoption, or, a, or, a, uh, or it is not a matter of chance. 
It is a matter of design because the human and female chemistry complements the male anatomy and vice versa. Well, not vice versa. The, the male anatomy literally is designed for the human female anatomy. You know what I'm saying? So the woman does not get attracted to the male anatomy. You need to understand that. You know what I'm saying? And that's what evolutionary biologists cannot solve by now. But okay, we get that. Hence, you know, men in pornography and men, women, you know, traces. Hence, cosmetic industry putting women there and uh, not men. Hence, in Islam, you know, women to be covered, not men. So, so the woman gets only complimented by the, the anatomy of the man. But the man literally gets attracted and is the source of all human species to survive. So the, the woman's anatomy is the key here. And the man's chemistry is the key here. How do they come to be in the same time and, you know, complete the picture? So this is, this is not evolution. This is intelligent design and amazingly immaculate timing by a substance, in their opinion, which couldn't even think. It's just a blob.